Hello and welcome to Retro 48K. The Sony PlayStation was the absolute undisputed champ of the fifth generation console wars, and by some margin, which was all the more unexpected really since Sony was you know it was their first entry into the console market and they just knocked it out of the park. It sold over a hundred million units and had a whole catalogue of just absolutely amazing titles that changed just the face of gaming completely. How did it create those games and was it really any more powerful than the Saturn, as rumours suggest and as most people think? Well let's take a deep dive into its technology and find out, because I think the answers to those questions might surprise you. Firstly from a high level, the main components of the system are similar to what you've seen before. You've got a CPU, a GPU or graphics processing unit, an SPU which is a sound processing unit, CD-ROM, some memory or RAM, and a communications device which controlled access to memory cards and the controllers, etc. And for those of you that have looked at my other Technic Correct videos, this probably won't surprise you as you may be spotting a pattern here. From this high level, it's not too dissimilar to what came before it, but it's in the detail that the PlayStation really stands out. Firstly, let's take a look at the CPU. This was a 32-bit RISC-based CPU, which ran at 33 megahertz, which at first glance might sound quite impressive considering most of the consoles we've run up to now, including the Saturn, the top speed was 28 megahertz. But the SH2 chip that was in the Saturn could actually do more instructions per second than the PlayStation. The Saturn could do 37 million instructions per second, and Sony's machine could only do 30. Uh, which I assume is down to the Saturn's SH2 chip actually doing more instructions per cycle. So basically, if the Saturn's chip was doing 15 instructions per cycle and the PlayStation's doing 10, the PlayStation would have to be at least 50% more powerful than it than its, its base clock to, to hit, hit that same level, uh, you know, based on those calculations. And then you, when you consider that the Saturn had two of those chips, it starts to actually look quite underpowered compared to the Saturn, which is confusing based on what most people think. Well, Sony had an ace in the hole and what really elevated the PlayStation above a lot of its competitors, and that was the core processor what Sony called the Geometry Transfer Engine, or GTE. Now I mentioned in my Saturn's video it had a, a chip to do some of this, but Sony's was just way above that in the terms of its design. This little guy was an absolute beast. The GTE was designed specifically to do the kind of coordinate transformations and light source calculations needed for 3D, and it did them at, at a ridiculously high speed by a parallel processing mechanism. Uh, basically it was like the PlayStation CPU was cheating at a maths exam because it brought a calculator along with it. That's how good this chip was. And it's how it maybe lacked the raw power of the Saturn but could outperform it because of the specific dedicated hardware for 3D. Now to understand how all this worked together to produce graphics, we need to bring the graphics processing unit into the equation as well. And this is what actually draws what you see on screen. But it does so using instructions that are sent from the CPU and what's in the frame buffer or video memory and, and putting them together and drawing them. The guiding principle of the PlayStation was that the CPU would transfer texture images and color palettes to the frame buffer. It would then ask the GPU to draw polygons based on the coordinate and color information it got off the geometry transfer engine. Now this might sound like a lot and really complicated, but it did this really fast. The PlayStation could display a total of 4,000 sprites and 18,000 polygons per second, in addition to 360,000 per second if they were flat shaded, i.e. they didn't have a texture on them. And the other unique aspect of the PlayStation was that it handled 2D the same as 3D. Everything was 3D to the PlayStation, basically. It was just simpler calculations for the GTE, since it only really had to worry about the Z position, i.e. what should appear in front of what. And this meant the old idea of the tiled layers was kind of redundant to a large degree. In previous Technically Correct episodes, I've talked about tiles and layers, etc. But in this case, it might be easier to explain how the frame buffer and video memory worked as it's the same for 2D and 3D and basically the PlayStation was always working in 3D as I said. 
So that frame buffer or video RAM, but from now on I'm just going to call it frame buffer just for simplification. Um, it was basically one megabyte and it can be thought of as basically a space in a size of memory that was 1024 by 512. Now the maximum resolution of the PlayStation that it could display was 640 by 480 and you would set aside that display area within this buffer. Obviously the small, smaller you had that resolution meant you could potentially have multiple areas to work on at once but as you can see by the graphics on screen if you had one that was by 480 you pretty much filled a large quantity of that RAM so you wouldn't be able to work on more than a frame at a time. You could then set aside an area for text for a texture page, which would hold the sprites or textures that you wanted to apply to your polygons. And then you could have as many color lookup tables as you could fit in it. This is why um, on Wiki, it says that the PlayStation could have unlimited color lookup tables. It's not quite true. You could have as many as you could fit in that remaining space of RAM, um, but it wasn't unlimited. It just was in practical terms, unlimited, you would run out of colours pretty much before you, you you filled that space. And then basically the, all the GPU was doing was just assembling those textures in that display area and, and drawing it out to the, the video output based on what the CPU and GTU was telling it should be. So as I said before, the, G, the CPU would take those calculations, chuck them at the graphics processor unit, it would assemble them in that frame and then draw out what should be on the screen. And, and that is quite an oversimplification because you've got things like transparencies and layering colors over the top which makes things a bit more complicated in terms of color math and things like that but that is generally the principle of how it worked and unlike the Saturn the PlayStation was actually capable of drawing both square polygons like the Saturn's quads but it could do triangular based ones as well and also unlike the Saturn when it was applying textures they weren't locked to the coordinates of those polygons they were they could be laid over them in any way shape or form they wanted to and moved around and this is how effects like the shine on Gran Turismo were possible because textures could be moved across the shape independently uh, which just for reflections and things was perfect for it there were limits however and while the PlayStation could handle any size sprites up to 256 by 256 pixels with 32,000 colors per sprite the color modes you ran did have an effect so the frame buffer had two color modes 15 bit which is the exact same as the SNES and allowed up to 32,000 colors and 24 bit which is a true color mode which had around 16.7 million colors uh, but the 24-bit mode, you would think, well, why wouldn't you just use that all the time? It had some downsides as it limited some of the drawing functions that were available while you had it in this mode. But the thing is, all colour computation and calculations were still done in 24 bits regardless of which mode you had. So you could use various tricks and, and techniques to actually get pretty much a, you know, a fake full colour mode while still in 15-bit to get colours above that phrase. Um, if you want to know the difference between 15-bit and 24-bit, basically you have 15 ones and zeros to make up a colour, which basically means the different combinations of ones and zeros. With 15 bit, you've got 32,000 of them. With 24 bits, it goes up to 16.7 million different combinations. That's how those are done. If you want a more in depth look, to check out my SNES and Mega Drive videos, or because I cover it far more detail there. But the PlayStation was full of little tricks like these colour modes and you know calculations that you could get around, such as having a specific texture cache to support moving textures between the GPU and frame buffer. Now memory access is always, you know, getting it to the bits that calculate it is always really slow in PCs. While it's in a processor, it's really quick, but you don't want to be going back to memory all the time, hence why they have various caches to keep it there. And this improve this texture cache improve things no ends because when you're drawing graphics the reality is you probably won't draw a polygon of the exact same size more than once but for a texture you probably will like use that texture repeatedly if you're doing a wall that has the same texture across it or even character you know jeans you might use the same texture more than once so having a cache specifically for that sped things up no end and really sped up that memory access in terms of sound, the PlayStation sound processing unit was actually a custom 16-bit sound chip. Uh, it offered 24 different channels and a sample rate of 44 kilohertz with also MIDI sequencing and added its own sound buffer. Uh, the trick here was it could also decode 
information directly off the CD-ROM and, it, and that which had its own buffer as well so that it sped up access from that and it m could mix all this sound information together before sending it onto the sound output but as you may have noticed in this series I'm not really a sound guy so I won't get too much in deeper into this as I'd be well out of my depth but I will say that from what you read about the PlayStation, uh, Sony's background in music technology really helped them a lot here. Uh, and there is a reason why some models of PlayStation are sought out by audio files due to their CD playback quality. And that kind of brings me to the end. Uh, that's kind of it really. As you can tell, the, the PlayStation isn't as complicated as the Saturn. And in many cases, it wasn't anywhere near as powerful. Uh, where Sony was miles ahead, however, is it helped developers get the most out of the machine. They spent a lot of time working with Psygnosis, who they'd bought in the early 90s to develop both the software and the hardware of the PlayStation so that it was developer friendly. The PlayStation was the first console to promote uh, PC development rather than massive custom built development kits that you will code and everything on. Developers could simply plug a development PlayStation into their PC, download the software, and off they went. And these development PlayStations look similar to graphics cards of today's. It's just basically a big PlayStation with more RAM on a card that you would slot inside your workstation, code on your PC, and move it directly from memory on the PC to the extra RAM on the PlayStation. And this was a monumental leap forward for developers. They were already starting to look at PCs and developing on that. So while coding for them wasn't quite the same as coding for a PlayStation, a similar development environment helped them no end. In fact, Peter Molyneux of Bullfrog and Linehead fame stated at one point that they could port a PC game for, uh, a game from the PC to the PlayStation in less than four weeks and then optimize it in another two and after that, all developers would have to do is take the code, burn it to a disc, play it on a one of the blue debug PlayStations that you often see pop up on eBay um, these days that didn't have any copy protection on it. If that worked fine, you, after your debugging, you just then submit it for approval. It was a really easy process that just allowed small-time developers just great advantage. And it meant that you could develop for both the PlayStation and the PC simultaneously. You weren't limiting yourself to one market, you know, with other consoles um, and their developments you would have to basically start from scratch with just sort of the algorithms and rewrite them in a completely different language this had c as its base and it was much faster and then on top of all this sony had a series of libraries that were basically like pre-built bits of code optimized to get the most out of the system and this meant the developers could focus on the game not fighting with the hardware it's also hard to not overstate how much of a game changer the GTE was. It had its own libraries and commands which again helped the devs out no end. Remember the move to 3D made complex tasks just an order of magnitude more difficult. This was exponentially harder than coding on the Mega Drive and, and the PlayStation. So taking some of that complexity out of the equation was an, just an enormous help for them. Just calling a few lines of code on the GTE, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying it there, but you know, you get the idea that difficult 3D calculations were simplified for them in a lot of respect. And it just helped enormously and sped up development enormously. And then finally, you can sprinkle on some nice features like inbuilt MDEC, which was for video decompression and compression, which helped, you know, the Saturn had to have a separate card that you plugged in to get that really good video sampling. And that texture cache that I already mentioned to speed up texture access in between the frame buffer and the GPU. And suddenly you start to see why with all that raw power the Saturn have had, it didn't match the focus power of the PlayStation. If you were to think about it in car terms, the Saturn had just pure raw horsepower advantage. It was sticking a thousand horsepower engine in a road car. But the problem is the Saturn burnt it all off with wheel spinning and left just tyre marks everywhere and couldn't get it on the track. The PlayStation had less horsepower but a brilliant traction control system and at the end of the day, whichever car gets the most power down on the track was going to win and that was the PlayStation in this fight. Just it had the tools, it had enough power to get produce some stunning visuals for the time. It was a very calculated machine from Sony in that respect. They could have added more RAM, but they, they kept costs down. It's why it was cheaper than the Saturn at launch. They kept costs down, and 
they focused on allowing developers to get the most out of it. And with that, it brings me to the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. It was really fun sort of digging into the PlayStation and there's loads of great PlayStation developer communities out there to this day where I was able to get sources from of the original presentations Sony were giving on, on the system and things like that. So there's some great wealths out of there and I'll put a few links in the description of some of the sources I've used. But if you've noticed anything I've got wrong or you would like to comment or just any other comments, please put them in the comment section i do like to read them and if i have if you do you know tell me that i've got things wrong and i need to do some corrections i will pin those comments up there so people can see what i did get wrong if any because this is just a hobby um, it's, I'm, it's not a full-time job so i hope i probably will get a couple of things wrong here and there um, and if you have enjoyed the video if you could give me a like that would be much appreciated and if you've enjoyed the series then please think about subscribing it again it's always very much appreciated as always, I've been Retro48K and I'll see you in my next video.